It's my first Evidence Live. I'm really pleased to be here. Some great speakers and we're presenting a poster for the first time today. I'm from Colombia. I have been working as a professor of pharmacology. Well, I'm the director of the German Cochrane Center. We are involved in uh, promoting evidence-based medicine for a network in Africa. This meeting is a bit unusual because the aim is to be a kind of overarching forum for people to come and discuss a whole broad range of issues relating to the quality of evidence and implementing evidence in practice. And I think what we hoped to achieve was to spur on debate, to look at the problems that are currently facing the world of clinical practice, the world of research, and also to begin to think about solutions. Well, I'm really here to sort of see what the state of the art is, look at some of the big debates that many of the you know, gods of evidence-based medicine are having here to try and figure out you know, where is the field going, what are some of the ways in which it's responding to questions and criticisms from the general public who, after all, fund an awful lot of this work and actually are on the receiving end of it. The first moment I sat down, I sat down next to a lady from Malaysia and they just had set up also EBM projects there, so I think that is really useful for us to know and to, to learn from. So I am on statins, and I just uh, want to uh, make that clear. So when I left uh, Chicago, I did take the statins on Thursday and Friday, but I know the evidence changed when I got in the airplane and landed in England, so I stopped taking them this morning. Well, I always enjoy uh, coming I, I from the U.S. because it's always a slightly different perspective. And I think there's been trends in healthcare, and one of the trends now is some concerns that perhaps we're doing too much medicine and that there's more interest in enlightened restraint. So perhaps less therapeutic interventions, perhaps less diagnostic testing. So I, 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 I think from that standpoint, this conference is particularly helpful. It was great to hear from Richard Pito first off. He's someone hugely respected, done an amazing amount of work. Um, I loved hearing from Hal Williams about patient uh, involvement, how the interaction between the clinician and patient in dermatology. We've had Iona Heath here. She's such a, a, a wise, interesting, uh, unusual thinker about these issues. Um, I don't want to name, there are so many actually, and one of the things someone said to me earlier was, we love the debate, we love hearing famous people arguing with each other, and that's a great feeling of the sort of uncertainty, um, not being scared to air the uncertainties and the controversies and the disagreements. I thought it was great to see Richard Pito do the um, stuff that I've quoted from his ISIS-2 trial for years, which was about the subgroup analysis. Um, and the, uh, analogy by star sign. I mean, I just think that's, that's just such a great example of, of, of how not to do things well. Okay, this is great. So we sent it off actually to the Lancet, not to the BMJ, and um, they accepted it. And the editor said, yes, well, um, we're, we're happy to publish this, but we want you to run lots and lots of subgroup analysis so you can tell us which patients would benefit. And we said, no, this is ridiculous. But we didn't want to do it because it was going to kill people. And so they said, well, if you don't do it, then we're not going to publish it. And so we swallowed our principles and said, well, all right then. You know, just, I mean, that's what, well, that's what the refereeing process does. But we sent the programmer out. We told him to buy a newspaper with an, ast with the astro with an astrology column in it so we could classify people according to what birth sign they were born under. And of course, with 12 subgroups, it's absolutely easy. In fact, if you're born under Capricorn, as aspirin halved your risk of death. But if you were born under Libra or Gemini, it did nothing. And so we sent it back with lots of subgroup analyses, and this one up at the top. And um, Robin Fox said, well, hmm, well, all right, the paper's acceptable now, but you have to delete this astrology thing here because that's not serious. And we said, no, that is the only subgroup analysis that is serious. It's all the other ones that are not serious. For me, the highlight was Trish uh, Greenhall talking about mixing evidence-based medicine with clinical knowledge um, and a, a real-life sort of reality check. Um, those of you who follow me on Twitter might have seen this tweet. I certainly got, you know, quite a few dozens of replies when I tweeted that I'd fallen off my bike. The whole bike went up in the air and somersaulted and I came down very heavily on concrete, landing on my arms and also on the back of my head. Both my arms were deformed and completely useless uh, and I had marked numbness in the fingers of my hands, and my helmet was split. This history was uh, 
distilled into a couple of sentences from a junior doctor. Um, on the ward round the next day, 55-year-old female fell off bike. To me, the great benefit of a conference like this is that you can have the people on different sides of the argument actually talking together, you know, at, at the same time. And, and that, to me, is the exciting opportunity here. The most important for me that makes it worth coming is the multicultural aspect. And I'm, I'm really admiring people coming from, like, Syria even, uh, Egypt, uh, Malaysia, trying to implement EBM over there. Well-constructed programme, it's definitely asking the right questions. It's not beholden to evidence-based medicine, even though it's called Evidence Live. It's also questioning evidence-based medicine, so it's both reflective and transparent in how it's presenting what well, is a really good movement. It's made a huge contribution to healthcare, but uh, it's not the whole answer. I've probably been at this evidence-based medicine thing for about 20 years. And I think in those days we thought evidence-based medicine would give us some solutions. We just needed to collect together enough information and we'd know what to do. And I think we've gradually realised that it's a bit more complicated than that. And I think it's good to see that being explored here at the conference. I think it's been a great meeting. Lovely people, lots of sunshine. Uh, good argument, um, nobody sort of holding back, uh, and a real, I think, sense of progress. Well, what people will see, I think, when they're casually engaged in these kind of issues, is a lot of controversy. They'll read one thing in one paper, and another thing in another paper, and the Daily Mirror will say that, and the Daily Express will say something else, and they'll know there's uncertainty about some of these issues. What they'll understand, I think, if they knew more about this conference was, that people are grappling with those uncertainties, trying to resolve them, which is what ought to happen. About this conference, I think that uh, all people in the world that are interested in evidence-based care uh, need the evidence live uh, for the next years. It's the best conference in the world about uh, these issues.